But Narnia has 3,000 characters, Dot. It really doesn't. Just like Game of Thrones and Lord of the Rings has lots of characters. And apparently Mark Gordon counted every one and came up with 3,000. <laughs> Welcome to Talking Beasts from NarniaWeb.com, where we explore the world of C.S. Lewis and keep a watchful eye on the latest Narnia movie news. This is Talking Beasts. Welcome back. I'm Glumpuddle. I'm Dat. And I can't tell. Maybe it's the webcam overexposing, or maybe you're just still glowing from your stump and Arnie Weber victory. What's going on here? That is the webcam. I have slept since my victory. Okay, but still glowing, I would imagine. Oh, just a tiny bit. I fully expect somebody else to beat me eventually. Well, maybe it'll be today, because I'm going to ask you a stump question at the end of this episode. Ooh. And we'll see what happens. But before we get to that... We have got some Narnia news to discuss, kind of. Sort of. Some, Nar- some Narnia Netflix news. As far as we know, Netflix is still developing Chronicles of Narnia adaptations. Could have both episodic uh, and feature film content. It's a little unclear, but tell us what's going on at News Poster Dot. Okay, so Mark Gordon recently made some comments How he sold the idea of Narnia to Netflix, uh, one of the quotes, he says, After Game of Thrones, anything that smells or looks like Game of Thrones is something that people are excited about, unquote. I mean, fair. And then he also said, the pitch was that we would be selling not just one movie or one book as a series. There were 3,000 characters in Narnia. So there was this very ripe opportunity. But not surprisingly, this caused um, some reaction. Would you believe it, Dot? This caused a bit of a reaction among Narnia Uh, I mean, most people don't think Game of Thrones and Narnia belong in the same sentence. So, Well, one of those people, I suppose, would be Monty Jose. Uh, Monty Jose wrote, quote, This is riddled with concerns for me. I feel like Netflix was deceived into thinking Narnia is something that it is not. What happens when they don't get to make the content they wanted? End quote. And Rebacheep775 wrote, quote, Despite a shared medieval fantasy setting, in terms of tone and theme, Game of Thrones and Narnia are night and day. Colonel Clink wrote, quote, The Walden movies have been accused of trying to make Narnia too much like Lord of the Rings, and I personally wasn't bothered much by their Lord of the Rings-esque elements. It annoyed me that they focused so much on the climactic battles, but so long as the Lord of the Rings-esque elements didn't overwhelm what the book was about, I was fine with them. They were well done, and I'll take quality over originality any day. So there are there's different what, it, what how much should we really make of this you yeah. know, kind of questions floating around. But Dot, what is your reaction to these comments from producer Mark Gordon? I am completely one hundred percent unsurprised that Narnia has often been in the shadow of higher fantasy as a genre that. Narnia as a whole is more of a fairy tale setting, but it usually gets compared to high fantasy rather than fairy tales. And, I mean, everybody does want the next Game of Thrones. It's considered one of the biggest successes on television pretty much ever. And even though, like, I I think some of these articles are forgetting that it took two or three seasons for Game of Thrones to really catch on and to be the, like, major success it is considered to be today Mm -hmm. so i don't think anything will be the next game of thrones immediately like that is more of a concern for me than that they want to have the success of game of thrones like they're gonna make one season and be like this isn't what we thought it would be this isn't the major success we wanted even if it's an okay success Right. Well, let me address kind of the knee-jerk reaction to this, which I did on my Facebook. Uh, the, I did a quick Facebook Live. I just saw Rillian did, too, um, on the Talking Beast Facebook page. But the knee-jerk reaction to this is, oh, this means that Narnia is going to be just like Game of Thrones, right? That means it's going to be, you know, mil- you know, there's all a million characters and overarching plots, and there's going to be tons of sex and violence. It's going to be just like Game of Thrones. So I, I sound like I think, I think we're on the same page page there where that's not what this is saying this right. is simply a matter of okay um all this means and again i think the context is very important here 
uh, the article, this, this is just a couple quotes from Mark Gordon. Other people are quoted too. Just a couple of quotes from him where the, the, the larger article is about how successful Game of Thrones has been and b- people want to try to replicate the success of it. Typical Hollywood, right? Um, it's so, money. It's about, it's about the money. Right. And it's about, well, this was successful. Therefore, if we make more of it, that will automatically be successful. Um, and in the case of, and what he's saying when he said this was the pitch, he's not necessarily just saying, oh, it's, uh, you know, it's fantasy that, that's vaguely medieval, um, which Game of Thrones is. So in that sense, the comparison is somewhat uh, valid. Um but I think it's really the fact, and they, they talk about Marvel in the article as well. It's the idea of to make a franchise, we need to find a world that people want to keep on revisiting. Not so much, a, not just a story we want to keep on continuing, but a world that feels like it has tons of possibilities that people want to keep on going back to. Um, that's what Marvel has done. And uh, now that, that Game of Thrones has done a similar thing. Now I like what you what you said about where it was. Oh, it's about money. They just want to, you know, this was successful. We got to make another one. What often tends to happen is they misunderstand what it was that really made it a hit. Yeah. Now it's true, for example, that Marvel and Game of Thrones they have this kind of universe feel to them, and you know what Marvel's done is unprecedented with the cinematic universe and shared franchises. But at the end of the day, people like those movies because they like the characters. They feel like they get to know them. They want to go back and see them again. Um, but leave it to Hollywood to just latch onto the most surface level, easy to replicate thing. Oh, the, the movies were a success because they're in a universe. That's why everybody loves them. No, that's an element of, of something that's in them, but that's not yeah. the reason that's a hit. Well, yeah, that and they filled a void. Game of Thrones was pretty much the only fantasy show happening when it started. I think the closest thing that to it that the closest thing that came close to it in scope is probably Legend of the Seeker. But everyone was hungry for fantasy on television, like big budget fantasy on television. It's that they they filled a void. There was a market that wasn't being um, appeased. Right. See, that's a really good point. Hollywood tends to say, um, okay, that was successful. Let's make another one. And presumably it'll be just as successful. Like Star Wars, for example, we, we've been remaking Star Wars up uh, ten times a year yeah. ever since Star Wars came out. But the reason Star Wars was a hit is because no one had ever done anything like that before in that way. Oh yes. So if you're trying to do, if you're trying to do the same thing again, you've already lost something that made what ma- you've already lost the thing that made it a hit, which is what, which is that it was something new. So if you're trying to replicate something that came before it, th- th- that's yeah. not going to work. Um, so yeah, the whole, oh, we got to make another Game of Thrones and fill a void. Um, look, just tell a good story, make good characters that people want to see again and again. Besides, um, HBO is making a prequel series to Game of Thrones. There's already going to be a next Game of Thrones. It, there you go. So that's the next Game of Thrones. And, and Georgie Henley is going to be in that. Yes. So, exactly. We, the void has already been filled. Make your own thing. Make your own unique thing. Um what do you think of the comparison being made, though? Do you think it's fair for Mark Gordon as a producer to be saying, like, oh, there's, there might be an interest in Narnia because essentially implying that there is an interest in Game of Thrones, therefore there might be an interest in Narnia? Do you think that's a fair comparison to make, though? Or even Lord of the Rings. He, he talks about Lord of the Rings in the article as well. And there's a quote where he says, there's very little intellectual property. And when you have a worldwide, the, and the exact quote is, the fact is that there is very little intellectual property available. So when you have a worldwide gigantic brand like these books or Lord of the Rings, people are running to it. Um, so it's compared to Lord of the Rings as well. Are these comparisons uh, fair to you, you think? Well, first off, if he thinks there's very little intellectual property available, he has clearly not been to the library in a very long time. <laughs> like there, there, okay. are, there is, in terms of fantasy books and series, mm-hmm. there are so many like there is plenty to choose from and Netflix is choosing from those as well. Like uh-huh. um they picked up the Grisha verse. I'm actually wearing a shirt. Um Leia No, what's her name? Leigh Bardugo has written several fantasy books that fall into a greater Grisha verse. Grisha is the name of um, like one of the races in the series. Netflix picked mm-hmm. up an option for that as well, mm-hmm. 
and Brandon Sanderson keeps writing fantasy books and everyone's constantly talking about who's going to pick those up and so on and so forth. In terms of comparison, I don't think it's really fair because Narnia just doesn't have the same scope. It's like Lord of the Rings and Game of Thrones focus so much on like the minutia in the world building, even if it's not in Uh the story text, you have the appendices, you have other books. Lord of the Rings is just these seven fairy tales that like what you like, what is in them is what there is. And there's hints of things greater and beyond the scope of what the characters see, but we don't actually get into that. But Narnia has 3,000 characters, Dot. It really has lots of characters. Doesn't. Just like Game of Thrones and Lord of the Rings has lots of characters. And apparently Mark Gordon counted every one and came up with 3,000. The Rose Tree Dryad found it. According I actually to the, bothered to look it up. <laughs> according to the character list on Wikipedia, there are about 200. Yeah, I, I, I definitely don't think he meant 3,000 literally. I think he just meant it's a, it, it, it sounded like this was a, a verbal interview. And he was just saying 3,000 to mean it has a lot of characters. The whole, the whole point is that he's saying it's a world we can keep on mining for content. Um, and I don't know if you – have you actually seen Game of Thrones? Yes. Okay. I, I've watched the first episode – just yesterday I watched the first episode in preparation for this episode. And I've watched other uh, – I've seen a lot of clips as well. I know a fair amount about it. Um, the production design is great. Um, I mean, that's a very encouraging thing on a relatively modest budget. It's just so encouraging to see what they can do. But what I walked away with uh, after seeing that first episode and thinking about Narnia in that context was there's so much emphasis on the plot and all the different subplots and different character motivations. And this character wants this and the political drama. And it's it's so relentless and all these different arcs that I assume build and build and build and eventually cross over and come into conflict and it's this ever expanding balloon of a story and characters and world. Yep. Um Narnia is not that. Narnia, I would say the stories, the plots of Narnia are okay. It's really the atmosphere yes. that makes Narnia what it is and the willingness to stop and en- and enjoy a sense of joy. Those are two things that really make Narnia what it is. Like, the actual stories are okay, mm. but, like, if I just describe, what's the silver chair about? It's about these two, there's this lost prince, and these two kids have to go find him. It would say, like, okay, yeah, what's so great it. about... That's it. That's it. Well, that's the bones of it, but the meat on the bones is what makes it what it is. Um, so, I think that what would concern me if uh, Netflix and Mark Gordon are going into this um, with this attitude of... Um, we're trying to make something that's sort of akin to Game of Thrones and filling that void or whatever, is I'm worried that they will um, ex- want to massively elaborate on the stories. And they'll, they'll look at the books and go, these are pretty thin. There's not a lot to do with this. There's only, there's not that, actually, there's a lot less than 3,000 characters, and the plots are very straightforward. we got to add some drama and some complexity, and um, maybe this fits into what we were talking about with, that we were speculating about doing the... A whole episode um, expanding on the White Witch and her sister in right. Charn and adding more details and complicated plot. That is the thing that kind of concerns me, though. I don't know. Should I just be open to that and say, well, that's just part of taking a a book that's a few hundred pages and turning it into a multi-episode series. That's just, if you want to sustain a, a series, turn it into something episodic, that's just part of adaptation. Maybe I should just accept that and say, well, I hope they're true to the, to the essential themes, at least. Um, so that's kind of what I'm concerned with right now. Um, that's the aspect, if they're looking at this as the next Game of Thrones. I'm not worried about them shoehorning in sex and violence. I'm more worried about how they're going to handle um, making Narnia a much more complicated plot and what that could mean as far as expanding on it. How's that going to work? The trouble is like how you approach it. Like, if you frame the magician's nephew so that it's about Diggory. Diggory is the main character. You want to follow Diggory's journey. If that is how you frame it, then it doesn't actually make sense to have a flashback or a prequel, whatever, to Jadis and her sister. Because it's about Diggory. So, it's gonna... 
it's going to depend on how they want to go through it. Like, on the one hand, there there are so many thousands of years that Lewis just tells us nothing about. 3,000 characters. On the <laughs> other hand... That's never going to get old. Because... <laughs> He didn't tell us anything about them. Like, what do you put in there? Someone really super creative who had the right amount of flair for writing something similar to what Lewis wrote would have to handle that. And I'm not sure that person exists. Yeah, and I'm especially not sure that person exists with this production right now because it was, once again, we have Narnia apparently stuck in the shadow of other franchises. We know the Walden movies, I mean, they're, of course, they were only greenlit because of the success of Lord of the Rings. Yep. And because of that, I think it led, I know that you know Colonel Clink in the comments was saying he didn't mind, but because of that, I think it led to some unfortunate creative decisions. I think whatever wasn't, whatever would feel out of place in Lord of the Rings they tended to shy away from. Obvious examples would be um, Bacchus and Silenus. Yeah. And that just general joy and, and jollification. Um, yeah. That would feel a little strange in Lord of the Rings. Therefore, Walden looks at it and goes, what is this? This isn't Lord of the Rings. And um, and even, again, the the tendency, which even Colonel Clink didn't love, the tendency to emphasize the battles, even though it's really... The, you know, the girls playing with Aslan after the resurrection and then restoring the statues, that's what the end of the book is really about. Yeah. But, of course, they emphasize the be- the battle that's just a couple paragraphs because we have a battle in Lord of the Rings. So if you go in with that template of this is what we're, we're trying to take these Legos out of the Narnia book and reassemble them into some into a Lord of the Rings kind of formula, what you end, well, inevitably you're going you're gonna, you're gonna to end up with something that feels fairly generic and not very memorable because you just took something very unique and made it like everything else. Yeah. But I wonder if it's well. Of course, what Lewis did, he was taking advantage of the fact that he's reading a that he was writing a book, right. where you can leave, you can make the reader take part in the world building so much. Should I just be willing to to admit that? Well, of course, adding more detail that's just part of the adaptation here. That's part of we're trying to make that was a great book. We're trying to make a good movie or a good series. How much did I push back against that? So anyway, I'm, I'm, my thoughts are kind of muddled and unorganized here because this is something I'm going to be wrestling through here, I think, <laughs> right, as we go yeah. through the Netflix news. Um, does this uh, influence your over, overall expectations and your overall uh, opinion of the Netflix productions at all? No. I'm about at the same point I was before. This is exactly what I expected. <sighs> I mean, for me, yes, in that there's nothing here that's all that surprising. It's more that it's um, kind of disheartening to hear it said so plainly and unapologetically that, well, yeah, Game of Thrones was successful, and now we're going to make Narnia. Um, which, again, I should, I got to keep even, even reminding myself, let's have some perspective and some context. This was an article in the Financial Times. Yeah. It's like, of course, all the emphasis is on marketing. Of course, all the emphasis is on uh, what the market wants right now. That's what the article is about, and that's what they're specifically asking Mark Gordon about. Yes. Of course, that's what he's going to talk about. And again, he's a producer and a very high-level producer. He's the president of E1. He's he's not on the set every day directing this or writing this or anything. Um, so uh, let's have a little bit of uh, pr- perspective about this. Yes. Um, overall, I think there's still a lot of great reasons to be hopeful um, the creative freedom. I haven't been, have not mentioned Douglas Gresham enough here, and haven't mentioned the fact that again, what Netflix is most known for is giving creators a lot of power. Yes. So there's still hope that someone can come along that really believes in this stuff and will be given the creative freedom to do what they want with it and not just play it safe and just go with, well, Game of Thrones did this, so we have to do that. Right. Yeah. Um, I still feel pretty optimistic about Netflix overall, and hope we get some more news soon. But how hopeful are you about your chances at stumping our new Weber? I have done no studying, so... <laughs> well, you did pretty well last time, so let's see. Let's go. All right, this question was submitted by Reepicheep775. Decades before creating Reepicheep, a young C.S. Lewis wrote about a chivalrous mouse who would slay giant cats. What was that character's name? Oh, no. 
This was the land of Boxen he created. About to say, I have that brother, book Warney. on my shelf, but I can't remember <laughs> any of the characters' names. Ah, uh, yes. I would like a hint, please. Okay. All right. This character has the same name as one of the kings of Narnia. We'll narrow it down for you a little bit. Like a tiny bit. Frank, final answer. Frank is incorrect. Yep. The correct answer is actually Sir Peter. Ah, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, young C.S. Lewis and his older brother Warney would hide in a wardrobe that their grandfather built and make up stories about a land they invented called Boxen. I have seen it. The wardrobe. It's in the it's in the Waite Center. As have it's I. Very cool. Just visited there uh, last year to record a video. Um, but uh, okay, so if we count that question as part of the Stumpin' Arnie Weber competition, so that's negative one. That means that really and beat me. Actually, no, you still won. Actually, yes, it is. <laughs> oh, you're right. Never I mind. <laughs> I forgot. Never mind. You're still the nerdiest Narnie Weber. All right, but your struggles aren't over yet. You got out of reading the outro last time. You said, oh, I'll do it in the next one. And then you conveniently forgot that it was going to be your turn. And conveniently, we did too. Yeah, we all forgot. Yeah. Now's your chance to make your debut. Oh, boy. So if you scroll down on that, scroll down on that Google Doc at the very bottom there, you see it? I'm staring at it. Yep. All right, go for it. You've been listening to Talking Beasts, a NarniaWeb.com podcast. If you've enjoyed this episode, please consider sharing it with a friend. And be sure to subscribe and post a comment below or in the Talking Beasts Facebook group. You can also email us at podcast at narniaweb.com, dot at narniaweb.com, or glumpuddle at narniaweb.com. Special thanks to A.J. Aiken. For the latest Netflix Narnia news, visit narniaweb.com. Until next time, further up and further in. <laughs>